Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. So when I took over, I said, hey, we need to build a platform that can be not just serving for the government space, but also for other verticals. So we put the software in the Google Cloud and gave it the bells and whistles and decided to go after other verticals like property management, education, utilities, you know, nonprofit, et cetera. That was Casey Lalo, the CEO of IntelliPay, and this is episode 131 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. A California native with an affinity for softball and a passion for selling solutions, Casey may have grown up shelling almonds and playing sports, but his passion for sales took him down a very fascinating journey that led him straight to the top eventually. Now the CEO of IntelliPay, Casey came on with the company when it was just a government software platform that specialized in payments for taxes and municipalities. It was through Casey's influence that the company branched out into other verticals and really formed their niche in fee-based processing. Coined by Casey as a white glove fee management third-party processor, IntelliPay specializes in fee-based offerings for businesses trying to receive bill payments. They offer multiple front-end solutions that enable customers to pay their bills and have a multitude of back-end configurations that ensure the payments move through the proper channels. And they make it a point to swim upstream on behalf of the merchants to offer an integrated solution. So how did he get to all of this from selling Cutco knives? You'll have to tune in to find out. And as part of this episode, you'll hear Casey's predictions for the future of our industry, including how software companies will eventually become the new merchant and how fee-based offerings will leverage success. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Casey. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Thank you, Greg. Happy to be here. Great. So let's dive right in. If you don't mind, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. And we'll cover your professional background in a minute, but maybe just a few things like that to get started. Perfect. I grew up in a small town in California called Escalon. It's near Modesto and Stockton. And I grew up on an almond farm. And my dad owned 30 acres. We farmed another 100 acres and we had the machinery that would crack the shells and we'd take the almonds to Blue Diamond. So it drove me nuts, but (laughs) that's what I had to do, right? And so I was always involved in sports like football, basketball, and baseball. And my dad accused me of being in sports so I wouldn't have to work so much on the farm. And I don't think he was wrong, Right. but I enjoyed playing a lot of sports. I was very competitive when I grew up. I ended up playing football at a junior college in Stockton called Delta Junior College. And then I went away on a service voluntary mission for two years for my church and then came back and decided that football, when the the guys were bigger than me and they were faster than me out of self-preservation, I decided to go to, to BYU and play some intramurals, become an intramural star. So I graduated from BYU and then went back to the Bay Area, lived in the Bay Area for a couple of years, but decided that that was too close. People were too close to me. I needed to stretch my arms a little bit. So I moved back to Utah and met my wife and planted the roots and lived here happily ever after. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's discuss the company IntelliPay. So tell us what IntelliPay does. Yeah. IntelliPay, maybe it would be good to maybe do a little history of IntelliPay if that's all right. Sure, Um, absolutely. So IntelliPay, it was when I first took over, it was called GovTeller. And it was a government software platform that did uh, payment processing for taxes, municipalities, all of these government industries and verticals. The company had lost its funding and an ISO came in and bought it. And they, the ISO didn't quite know what to do with the software company. So the owner asked me to come in and take over. And, you know, if you're selling into the government industry, it's good and bad. It's good because they're very loyal. It's static. And you can count on clients being with you for a long time, as long as you don't mess up. But that's also the bad side of it, because there's not a whole lot of cities popping up here and there for new business. 
So when I took over, I said, hey, we need to build a platform that can be not just serving for the government space, but also for other verticals. So we put the software in the Google Cloud and gave it the bells and whistles and decided to go after other verticals like property management, education, utilities, you know, nonprofit, etc. The thing that intrigued me about IntelliPay was the fee-based processing. So it specialized in doing the visa service fee program for government and higher education entities. And so I said, well, let's play off of that fee and focus on you know surcharging for B2B, surcharging for B2C. Let's do convenient payment processing. Let's do you know service fee processing or some sort of a combination, whatever we could do the fee program became more of our niche in the marketplace. So IntelliPay is a payment platform. It's a gateway that's connected to First Data, Global, TSIS, WorldPay, Elevon, and Payment Tech. And then on the ACH side, it's connected to Paya, Jack Henry, and our own ODFI that we go to at Heritage Bank. So we try to offer multiple front-end solutions that allow people to pay their bill, whether it's online, over the phone, or in person. And then we have a lot of settings and configurations on the back end to send that transaction through the proper channel. Okay. And do you sell through a direct sales force, or do you have partners, or both? Both. I'd say all of the above. You know, we We have four sales channels, really. We have an FI channel or financial institution channel that resells us. We have a direct sales force. We sell through agents and ISOs. And we also focus a lot on uh, integrated software partners and integrating with them and then enabling them to upsell integrated payment processing to their clients. Okay. And you mentioned the roots and sort of the government area, and you've expanded out beyond that. Can you just maybe go through those verticals again so it's clear exactly who your targets are? Yes, I'd be happy to. So government is our bread and butter. That's the space that we've been in since 2005. And now we focus in other verticals that are looking for fee-based offerings. What I mean by that is if you're a B2B and you don't want to pay for your clients that are paying with their rewards cards and pay for their trip to Cancun, I will enroll them in our surcharging program and allow us to charge the fee on credit cards. But if somebody pays with their debit cards, we won't charge a fee. We also focus on property management. We do nonprofits because in nonprofit world, you have Nonprofits would like to offer both, right? They want to tug on the heartstrings of the donor and say, you know, last year we had to pay 3% of our revenue that came in for credit card processing fees. If you want to help us with that, would you mind paying the 3% and then we get 100% of the funds? If not, that's okay. We still want to accept your donation. So we'll go ahead and pay the 3% if that's not what you want to do. And you give somebody the opportunity to decide how they would like to donate. And if that nonprofit can now save 30, 40% of the donations, not have to pay the fees on those, it makes it a lot more profitable for them. Home services is a big industry for us. We're also in the auto space, unions and utilities. So one of the areas that we're not in is you know retail, restaurants and lodging. It's more of the billing and receiving payment industries that we can focus in. Okay. Yeah. And you bring up the convenience fee, which, you know, has been around forever, right? But I just think over the last couple of years, this whole notion of surcharging, and I think they, correct me if I'm wrong, but cash discounting is sort of the a similar thing, right? Has really become popular, but it sounds like your approach is a little different. Is that true? Yeah. So cash discounting, I think it's important if you're in the retail space and I'm not necessarily in those environments. So we try to come up with fee-based offerings for businesses that are trying to receive bills. And a lot of times I like surcharging because it's fair. You know that if somebody's going to pay with a rewards card and receive points or cash back, then perhaps they can pay the higher fees. And so passing along the fee to them is is fair. But if somebody's going to pay with a debit card that comes straight out of their bank account, and we all know that the interchange prices for those are lower, then yeah, maybe the merchant should pay for that. 
and it makes it a fair program. I love Visa's service fee program for the government space because that's a two transaction model where the amount due, maybe I'll just preface it this way. Let's say you're paying your speeding ticket and it's a hundred dollars, which we all know that speeding tickets aren't that cheap, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're paying your speeding ticket and it's a hundred dollars and we're going to charge a 3% fee. According to the service fee program, the hundred dollars gets processed on mid one and that goes into the court's trust account, but the fee amount is processed on mid two and that comes into our bank account. And then we use those fees to cover the cost of the processing for the municipality. So it virtually is a no cost solution for them. We cover all the costs for hosting, customer support, PCI, everything else. And they are happy because they get their money and they get 100% of it and it goes into their trust account. So to me, I'd love to see that program be expanded into other verticals because one, the merchant doesn't make money off of the fee, right? On a surcharge or a convenience fee model, sometimes they actually make more money. They're not supposed to, but it happens sometimes if your projections are off. And then sometimes it's, you know, they have to spend money on fees. But the service fee program and the way that's set up, it's a great program. And we essentially become this white glove fee management third-party processor that takes care of the fees and the entity just gets their money and they love it. You know, there's no additional accounting for that extra fund or fee coming in. They're able to just receive their money and they never get a bill and they never have to pay any fees. It's a beautiful program. Yeah, sounds like it. So how big is IntelliPay? We have 24 employees and we're headquartered here in Draper, Utah. We have remote employees now. That's becoming a, a very popular thing to get really good employees. We're probably going to process about $2 billion in credit card and ACH this year. So not the big boys, but not necessarily a really small company either. And we're kind of in that high growth stage where our technology and client base is growing. And uh, we're pretty excited about where we are right now. Okay. And you're in the U.S. only? Yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Domestic U.S. only. Okay. And what would you say differentiates your company from your competitors out there? Yeah, man, that's such a good question because this is my second gateway slash payment company. And when I sold the first one, I was kind of so burnt out that I vowed never to get into the payment space again. But, <laughs> you know, it just kind of has that love-hate relationship and I got sucked back in again and, and here I am. But when I took over as the CEO in 2013, like I said, I wasn't interested in competing with the big boys out there, like, you know, your authorized.net and your stripes and, you know, all those guys, they just have a really good product. So I'm like, well, how can I take over and make this company really grow while competing with those guys? And the big thing for me was the fee based offerings. Because I don't believe that uh, those other ones really focus in that area. They have some configurations that you can do, but it's not as clean as what we're trying to do. And then I also have a really good ACH backend system that I think separates us from our competition and the pricing that we offer there. And lastly, we definitely try to integrate with the merchant software. So a lot of what we do is focus on a merchant. The merchant's happy with our payment processing and we're not integrated. We try to swim upstream and ask that third-party software company if they wouldn't mind integrating with us so that we could have an integrated solution. So are you talking about sort of the QuickBooks of the world? Yeah, QuickBooks or if we're in a, let's say, a nonprofit vertical or the government space, we'll ask them if we can integrate with them to make it a better experience for the customers. An example, there's a government utility technology service or guts software out of Indiana. And, you know, we've been doing some business with them for years with some of our sheriffs and county clients. But now in meeting with them, it's like, hey, what can we do to make this a better experience? And let's integrate and offer a rev share for each other and, and make this a, a better experience for everybody making their payments. And that's really what we try to do. Now, obviously, it, that doesn't always work. And there are a lot of software companies that maybe have their own solution or they're integrated with somebody else already. 
and that makes it difficult. But if we can get these integrated software partners or vertical specific software companies that may have an accounting program that helps them run the business, we can certainly grow it and help and do a rev share. I think another example would be uh, Main Street Software. It's our, we ended up buying that company two years ago, 18 months ago, and they are an auto glass repair shop management company. So if you're going to run an auto glass repair shop or a commercial flat glass shop, these guys have the software that these owners can use to run the business. The backend software can connect to a QuickBooks, but in one of their versions, they have their own accounting package as well. So we said, hey, what can we do to help you grow your business? And one of the things was is offering up a rev share on the credit card processing side, giving them some integrated options like a standalone terminal or an integrated terminal, text to pay and mobile payments for the technicians in the field when they replace a windshield. Uh, that ended up being huge for them. And now uh, they've gone from doing uh, 3 million in credit card volume to 30 million in credit card volume. And it's been a nice win-win for both of us because we share in the revenue split and we work hard to take care of each other's merchants. Sure. Makes a lot of sense. So where do you see this industry, the payments industry heading in, say, the next two to three years? Oh, you know, I really see the software companies becoming the new merchant. You know, selling a standalone terminal, I think it's going to become really difficult in the next two to three years. I'm not saying it's going to be impossible because I believe there'll always be those shops that just want uh, a standalone terminal. But everybody that we call to when we try to sell, they ask the question, are you integrated with my software? And if the answer is yes, you know, we have a chance to win. But if you're not, then you're on the outside looking in and then somehow you have to convince that person why it's better to use your standalone solution versus their integrated solution. And that's a very difficult sell. So I think if someone wants to compete in the future, they're going to need to uh, be involved with some sort of an integrated solution and make it all wrap up as a full stack. Also, you know, with the increase in inflation that we're seeing right now, businesses are looking to cut costs. And, you know, that first thing that they look at is that daggum credit card statement with those fees. And, and so now they're looking to, oh, how can I cut costs? And, you know, they're probably getting two to three calls a day or a month from mm -hmm. people wanting to do their merchant processing. And the sales tactic is, is, well, yeah, send me your statement. Let me see if I can save you some money. And so you see this downward trend or cost reduction in fees and the shrinking margins. And I think you've seen that lately with these huge mergers of the big companies because they're like saying, okay, what can we do to come together and by economies of scale, reduce pricing. And that way we can offer lower prices to our agents and ISOs that are out there selling for us. And like you mentioned, the emergence of cash discount programs and, and other things that are out there, you've actually seen states pushing back on the surcharge program and allowing surcharging to be done in their states now because of the high fees. So you see this, the merchants being frustrated with these, the higher fees. So they're pushing back and trying to lower their costs. But at the same time, the processors are saying, gosh, how can we lower costs and still make money? And that's why I think if you can get in with an integrated solution, all of a sudden, the payment processor now controls the environment of pricing. And you can now say, okay, if you want integrated pricing, here's the price. And we don't have to go up or down on it. As long as you're not being ridiculously high, but you're being competitive, you now have the ability to offer software plus credit card processing at a fair price. And you don't have to try to give away credit card processing because it's becoming such a commodity. So I really believe that in the next two to three years, selling to the integrated software uh, or to the third party software provider for that integrated software solution is the way to go. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to make money in this business. I also think having some sort of a fee-based offering is going to help you be leveraged for success in the future. 
Okay. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So you mentioned going to BYU, graduating from there, and then maybe walk us through your career and how you went from there to being the CEO there at IntelliPay. <laughs> it's a fun story. So I sold Cutco knives. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, right? The knives that they do in-home presentations to support myself through college and school. And I I was always involved in sales. I love doing that. I love coming up with solutions for people. And I became a sales guy for a software company. And I made a bunch of sales and they were integrated. It was a kind of a security offering. And it took a while for those sales to come to fruition. We had the deals closed, but because the software had to be integrated, it took a while for me to capitalize on those commissions. In the meantime, the company was bought out by a private owner, private equity firm, and they said, well, we're going to go in a different direction and we want to bring in our own people. So me and half the company got let go. And that was very frustrating to me because I was like, man, I did all this work and now I'm not going to reap any rewards or benefits like I was promised. And I swore at that point that I was never going to make anybody else money again. I was going to do it all myself. (laughs) (laughs) It was a bold, bold strategy. I don't know. I guess it was I was young and dumb at the time and just fed up and said, I'm going to do it myself. At the same time, a software friend of mine that had worked at the same company was let go. And he was offered a small contract to build a recurring payment software module for dentists. And so I went out and I tried with a friend of mine to try to start this medical coding business for doctors. So I thought, hey, the economy goes up, economy goes down. I'm going to do medical coding and billing for doctors. And I know I'll be safe and it won't be a problem. Problem is, is finding your first client, right? So The doctors were like, hey, Case, I really like you. You're a good guy, but what's your differentiator and why should I use you? And I basically had nothing. So I was not doing very well. Same time, my software friend made the software and was about 80% done with it when the guy that contracted him came to him and said, hey, I'm out of money. I can't afford to pay you anymore. I'm actually going to go in this direction and not do this project anymore. So as payment, I'm going to give you all the code and sign it over to you. (laughs) My software friend was like, what am I going to do with this software? I don't sell. And so we ended up having lunch one day and I'll never forget it because I'm crying on his shoulder about, I don't have a differentiator. I got nothing to sign up these doctors with. And he's like, I got this software and I got nobody to sell it. And so the light bulb went on for both of us. And we said, I'm going to go and try to see if I can sell this recurring payment software platform to some of these doctors as my differentiator and say, hey, not only can I help you with the insurance billable side, but I've got this cool technology to help with the private portion of the payment side. So I went back to a lot of these doctors and I said, it's me again. I got my differentiator and this is why you should work with me. And they said, Case, hey, you know, we really like you and thanks for coming back. We don't want you to do our medical billing, but we want to use your software to collect payments for the private payers. And I was like, huh, okay, well, I'll just sell you the software then. And after three or four of these calls, it wasn't hard to figure out, hey, I think I got something here. These doctors need something to help these patients make their private payments or co-pays and this installment software. So if you had a procedure that was going to be 1200 bucks, the doctor's office could log in and set you up on $200 a month payments. And once it was done, the software would stop and it did ACH your credit card. So I went back to my friend and I said, hey, I really think we have something. We should create an entity and make sure we have the code so nobody can come back and claim it from you. And let's create an organization, bootstrap this thing and see what we can do. And he agreed. So we, it's kind of two guys in the garage bootstrapping a company and we went out and started selling it. And man, it took off and we ended up getting an ambulance company in Salt Lake City and some other clients. And it was really a fun opportunity. And Lo and behold, a regional bank corporation came along and they saw it and they liked it. And they said, we'd like to use it to sell to our treasury management accounts. And so after four years, five years, we ended up selling it to them. And that was my first kind of entrepreneurial experience where we sold a company. And it was a great venture. 
it didn't make me, you know, the Elon Musk of the world where I had <laughs> millions and billions of dollars to work with. But hey, for a guy that kind of stumbled into this thing and had no clue about the payment space, it was awesome. And so we thought, okay, what's the next one? And unfortunately, that was in 2008. So there wasn't a whole lot new going on at that time. But then I went back to work for a payment processing company that acquired our software and worked there until my friend that bought GovTeller asked me to come and take over. And when I did, I actually brought my friend that helped me build the other company along with me. His name's John Moss. And he and I rebuilt this one and we're here today. And I love it. So you've been doing this payments thing a while. About 20 years. Yeah. And not just the payment side, but the software side of it. I'm not a coder, but uh, sitting next to one as we designed the user interface, the back end system, the billing system, he gave me baptism by fire on, you know, the technology and what we can and can't do. Because I, I was so dumb back then that I would put the page on a PowerPoint page and I'd say, see, this is what it should look like. Why can't you just code this tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and he had to put up with me for a while, but sooner or later he trained me. And, you know, I was the young and dumb sales guy that would walk in and the client would say, hey, can you do this? And I'd say, yeah, absolutely. We could do this. You know, then I'd go back to him and I'd say, can we do this? <laughs> right. And he'd go, oh my gosh. Don't do that anymore. Yeah, we'll do it. But stop doing that. So he trained me after a while. And now I don't overcommit on any technologies whenever people ask me that question. But it's been a wild ride. You know, like I said, when I sold the company, I thought I'd go do something else. But when you understand interchange, you understand how to sell, you understand the terminologies, all the acronyms and everything else. And it just kind of pulls you back in. And this time around, it's been a lot of fun. I actually brought a lot of the people that were with me at my prior company over and, you know, kind of put the put the band back together again, you know, and this time it's been really a fun ride. And I love our staff. I love our partners. And it's just been a, a really good experience this time around. Great. That's a great story. Well, what are some things that you're passionate about? So maybe one work-related thing and one personal thing. Yeah, I'm very passionate about selling solutions. Like I love to go into a client and have that client say, I need this. So for example, this ambulance company, they have multiple cities that they do the billing for in addition to their own trucks that they run. And so they needed a payment portal where these different cities could have their patients go to one location and type in an account number and then have that portal route that patient to the appropriate city or billing company to process the payment. And I listened and I wrote down my notes. I didn't tell them I could do it or I couldn't do it, but I went back to our technology team and I said, this is what they want to do. How can we make it work for them? And we were able to put together the solution so that when a patient from American Fork, Utah types in their account number at a Gold Cross Ambulance website, it's directed to that American Fork Ambulance mid so that it processes on their merchant account and is deposited into their bank account. And that was pretty fun. So I'm very passionate about listening to what people need and then coming back with the right solution. And then in my personal life, I love softball. I think the sports that I played as a kid has never left me. I've tried to coach my boys and my daughter, but I love competitive softball. It's slow pitch. And I actually travel around to different cities and play competitive. We go to Worlds. This year, we went out to Portland, Oregon, and played against some of the top teams in the Western U.S. And I went to Vegas for a senior team, play on a 50 and older senior team. We went to Vegas and played teams from all over. And it's so much fun. That is my passion. Besides my family. I love my family. Yeah. Having that competitive thing still, you know, as part of what you do, I think is important for all of us. Yep. I hate to lose. 
<laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear yeah. you. Well, I've been in the payment space, I don't know, going on 15, 16 years, I think. So not quite as long as you. But when I got into payments, it certainly wasn't on purpose. It wasn't that I was looking for a career. Uh, sort of fell into it and haven't been able to get out of it since. But, you know, this day and age, kids are taking classes in college, fintech courses. They look at payments as sort of a you know, hot, sexy industry to be in. So curious, what would your advice be to someone coming out of college? They're looking at the payments industry. What would you tell them that they should do to be successful? Isn't that so funny? I'm with you. The same thing. I wasn't looking to go into the payment space and I completely stumbled into it. And here I am. If I was a college student and learning about the payment space and I wanted to get into it today, I would certainly try to have a strategy around how can I offer integrated solutions? So, you know, Clover's a good example of that. That's a full stack integrated solution for point of sale and retail places, right? So if I am selling into other companies, how can I offer an integrated payment stack? So maybe partner with a gateway or partner with a technology company that offers those types of offerings. So you can come into a scenario and perhaps your client wants a standalone terminal and that's all they want. That's great. You got that up your sleeve. But if somebody says, well, I need an online payment page. I need to take payments over the phone. I want to do text to pay and I want it integrated with my back end system, whether that's QuickBooks or Peachtree or, or whatever it is that they're using you have somebody that can help them with that integrated solution and offer a full stack or a full suite of payment solutions. Because I think the days when you and I first started where we were leasing terminals and trying to make money, you know, that's not working anymore. So you've had to evolve. And I think the next step in evolution for the payment space is for the agents and the ISOs to be able to sell integrated solutions and connect with these technology companies and help them sell their software. Yeah, I totally agree. That's a great place to be in. That's where the industry is headed for sure. So we've covered a lot of ground, Casey, about you and your background and the company and the industry as a whole. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I I think that covered. I sure appreciate the time. I'm honored and humbled that I get a chance to talk about me. Not comfortable doing that all the time, but I'm grateful for the invitation. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for being on the show. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 